We are back with the Primarchs, guys. We got my uh, friend here, Fro, and one knows the fellow Primark, and I am Joe. And this video today is on deployment. And deployment is a very, very important factor in uh, 40k. It's probably one third of the importance of an actual uh, win or lose battle because it's so it's that high of a uh, high up there. Now, let's see here. Because deployment is so important, and there's pretty much only three for standard deployment types. There is the cross the table, there's a long way, and then there's an annoying uh, angle deployment, which is uh, oh, pretty much everyone kind of, you know, kind of goes, eh, let me get that. Uh, and then, of course, there's tons of different um, scenarios that go with it, but I just want to talk mostly about the deployment of setting up and how important that is. And um, because of the... There's, I hate Seize Initiative, I really do. I understand why they put it in there for the random factor taking, but there's already such a downside to placing your models first. And to lose the Seize Initiative, that 1 in 6 chance is so annoying. But you have to be ready for it, because it's in there, it's not going away. I was always planning that it would go away in this edition, and it didn't. So, because it's there, plan for it. And so with that being said, let's pretend you have first turning. Going first is very difficult. Because going first, you don't know where the enemy models are, you don't know where they're going to put them, and it's kind of hard to, to judge where exactly you're going to put your army. So what do you do? Well, first of all, you got to the best way to deploy is look at the other side of the table and figure exactly where you would place your models if you're in that scenario. Uh, I also want to say before I go too long, if you're wondering why we're wearing the same shirts, we're not that poor. We just made the video on the same day. <laughs> we're going to have a couple of days. So just, but, uh, just had to throw that out there. But anyways, with that being said, um, look at the other side of the table. Before you put any of your models down, take a look at thing. And while you're doing that, scan his army list. So you'll know exactly what. Everything is put into categories. Uh, there's really only out here pretty much only like two lists in 40k. That doesn't mean two armies, it means two lists. It's either I'm going to blow you off the table shooting lists or it's going to be uh, assault lists which are very rare. Okay, or um, I guess there could be a possibly three which is again, even that's a thing, like a mechanized list is a mechanized list. It still falls into the shooting list. It's going to be shoot. Sometimes mechanized can have assault but there's still the two type lists. I'm either going to assault you or I'm going to shoot you. So if let's say you're playing against a shooting opponent, you're going to look at the building and you see this building right here. You obviously know there's no buildings over here. Maybe a little forest or little trees. The Space Marine book could be a cover. You're going to deploy, he's going to deploy in that building because that building is a ruin, so a four plus save. So A, you deploy a unit near there that can, you know, destroy it. Because you want to be when you deploy in a threat range that you're not going to expose yourself because you could seize an issue so you don't want to just set something in the open always deploy your models in cover and know it sucks moving through cover but there's a lot of vehicle upgrades you can get to move through cover the worlds there's a so you only move three inches instead of six you're not going to get shot if you lose his initiative and have no save at all because ap2 because he's going to put a unit of devastators in there or whatever by you putting that unit in place is now making him go shoot, do I deploy in that ruins or do I deploy somewhere else? And if he doesn't deploy in those ruins, it already is beneficial to you because now he doesn't have a 4 plus save and a 3 plus go to ground. He's going to deploy in the Space Marines Codex book, which is only a 5 plus save, which is not as effective. So right there you've already, you know, hurt him. So you don't got to, don't put all your eggs in one barrel and just say this is uh, one basket and this is how we're going to kill it. Make sure that you look at all those terrain pieces and have a counter for every single terrain piece. Yeah. The second factor of deployment is objectives. Uh, if there's an objective here and no objectives over here, why the hell are you deploying way over here? That just doesn't make any sense. Now I'm going to bring up a scenario battle for one that was, uh, there was two objectives to this table and two great pieces of terrain. And I deployed second and he deployed first. And he assumed that I would go over and I did a really good sway because um, you have to set fortifications up in this tournament before you deploy. That's how the rules were. So I deployed my defense wall in the corner where I knew if I deployed my defense wall, he would assume that's where I'm going to put my entire army. And he dropped his entire army on the other side to counter it, but there was no objectives over here. Objectives were all over here. So now he was already far enough away, so when he went first and deployed his army down, I had nothing over here. Nothing was in range. I hit everything over here by the objective that could t hold it and then move around the table 
and now I could control his old army because he had to move towards me. So by using a 50 point defense wall, for not for the purposes you usually would think you'd ever use it on, by going um, and setting that up, it screwed the whole deployment for that opponent and he lost the game, a superior list to my list at the time because of that deploying at a defense wall. So that shows you how important defense walls are. Some giant Jedi mind tricks there. It was. He had it. <laughs> there were Jekas were both here aside. So he didn't worry about that deployment because he was figured. But he only had a couple key units over there. I blew those couple key units, moved to the table, took both objectives, and anything that slowly made its way over, it was just lost. Um, so that's very important. So first turn is a weakness, like I said, but it can also be a strength. You have to know exactly where your opponent's going and deploy accordingly so you can deal with it while keeping in cover. Do not get greedy. Do not send all your, and you're going to hope that he's not going to roll season initiative because that's going to be the game he does. And again, because um, we're on deployment here, certain things need to be protected in deployment. Uh, for instance, um, a demon prince, for instance. A demon prince, if he has wings, can fly, which is very hard to kill while it's flying. But that first damn turn, he's on the ground. And as somebody gets these initiative, or goes first, they have a drop pod come in, he's on the ground, he's dead. You're going to lose a very expensive demon prince. Uh, it's, it, you can't do it. I mean, if you're Nurgle, you can deploy in of ruins, you at least have a 2 plus cover safe because you're in the ruins because they're shrouding. That's a little safer. But if you're otherwise, a demon prince is a 3 plus armor save pretty much, he's going to be, he's going to be hurt. So you can, for that scenario, things like that, if you don't have first turn, you probably want to put that Demon Prince in reserves because it's a lot of points to lose a two to three hundred point model because of that. Uh, what have you noticed through deployment, Fro? Um, <clears throat> I want to say this much: um, objectives count for a lot, um, and you know, in some scenarios, you're, you know, you're going to have six, and they're going to be changing. You're getting all sorts of new cards. Uh, one thing I've learned so far from experience is to not jettison your entire army toward you know one or two specific objectives. You got to kind of um, allow it to play out a little bit more, right? You need to allow it to be a bit more dynamic and you say, okay, well, my unit's going to go in the middle of these two objectives instead of just being a beeline for one. So basically just don't tunnel vision, right? So kind of be a little more adaptive. Seventh edition has turned into a mobility race so game. It. It's pretty much what fifth edition was. Because remember in fifth edition, last turn you did whatever you could to drive to an objective, <laughs> take an objective, and you won the game by taking the objective. It was... It's how it was played. You know, we didn't know any better that time. It was fun. Um, it sucked for other people, but it, it, now we look back and go, that really sucked. But then it was cool. Uh, now you have no choice but to move from objective to objective. Objectives pretty much aren't anything until they actually activate, which could be a whole game. Objective two could never come up. Which mysterious objectives are my favorite, by the way. <laughs> I, hate I love, I love friends. Rule and everything. I it's hate, fantastic. This is why we're different. I hate this random shit. I'm not gonna go to a damn objective and find out it has some <laughs> sort of bomb on it. Like, give me a break. Yeah, woo, sky fire. Most tournaments <laughs> just to get rid of all those anyways. Thank God, and that helps me and it cheers me up. What do you mean? The, what do you mean the forest is carnivorous? No. Oh, God. <laughs> um, so again, he's right with objectives, deployment types. Because some are very hard, so we're gonna, that's the way I talked about a little bit in the standard deployment, which is, I think they call it now, uh, Don't uh, I used to call it, yeah, Dawn of War. Oh, I, I was wrong, yeah, Don't, it's uh, Vanguard War. Strike is the uh, yes. quarters, yeah. Dawn of War is pretty much standard deployment, you have 12 inches of the table, he has 12 on the table, and you have that 36 inch gap, I believe, right, I'm pretty sure, uh, 12 and 12, 24 20, 20, inch gap, sorry. Yeah. So with that gap, that means you have, depending on where you deploy, any weapons that are about 30 inches to 36 inches and and plus that are now a threat in that deployment. So if you're deploying and you only have 36 inch guns or 40 inch guns as your best guns, where should you deploy? Only. That's, uh, but that's not bad. Yeah, that's okay. not that great either. I mean, 40 inches sounds like a lot, but it's not that when there are so many bigger guns that they can fire 60 yeah. inches or 72 inches. Um, where do you deploy those inches? So if you're playing that standard game, you want to deploy your 40 inch guys near the center of the table if you're going first. The reason being again, be 40 inches will cover pretty much the whole table wherever he decides to deploy. If you deploy your plasma guns over here that have a 36 inch range, I'm going to deploy over the air side and your whole plasma guns you pay 200 you're points for, turn. Yeah. they're useless. You're not going to shoot anything. And if you, by the time you move there, you're not, it's not worth it. Um, so. That being said, you always want to make sure you're playing the inches. And inches are very important in 40k, just like they are in real life. So, if you have a 72-inch gun, who cares? 
I mean, you can put that anywhere you want because it pretty much can touch any of the table. Right? Yeah. So we're not going to bother talking about that kind because you obviously know that. But there are certain weapons that are 36, 48. Those are all center weapons. Um, your vehicles also, you want to have... You, you take a look at the things and see the objectives that you want to be in striking distance of. But you don't want to expose your vehicles. Vehicles are not there just to be blown off the table. I mean, in actual real war, in mechanized armies, usually the tanks, like the APCs, drop the men off and don't go up. They don't risk the things. They do sometimes now, because the APCs are a lot stronger nowadays. But I'm talking World War II, you didn't risk your half-tracks. You would half-tracks would drop the men off and they would stay back. You, um, they're lightly armored and they don't need to be killed. So with that, keep them behind cover until necessary, but know exactly what objective you're going to go for because you want it with a standard vehicle because not everyone has the wonderful skimmer ability to turbo boost so far. <laughs> you've got a flat out of 12 and a move of 12, you move 24 inches. That's a pretty good. So you want to make sure you're in near the center with at least one or two vehicles that are in striking range to go in the V pattern. Anywhere they need to go, they can get those objectives because objectives are pretty much scattered to the table. If you put a vehicle over here and there's no objective over here, that vehicle is pretty much useless for the entire game. Don't deploy your vehicles where there are no objectives. That's They're there for taking objectives. You don't take a vehicle because you're going to send them an objective. That's just kind of pointless. You can just take a big squad of men and take less points. You take a vehicle because you want to get across the goddamn table. Um, that's pretty much it. So deploy them accordingly to where objectives are. Or else you're wasting them. You wasted your points and you're wasting the effectiveness of a mechanized list. A mechanized list is designed to take an objective at speed and hopefully hold it. And you hold it by the men inside because the vehicle's going to get destroyed. You might get lucky with a couple cover saves, but then the men get out and they will secure the objective or at least put up enough fight that they're going to be there. Like running five man squads is risky, but that's again, that's a whole new topic we're not going to get into. Uh, the next deployment type is uh, Hammer and Anvil. Hammer and Anvil is a pain in the ass when I'm playing Tau. Because Tau has a pretty much a kill zone of 36 inches. Hey, and this is a buddy. long <laughs> way. Um, anyone that knows that, and you, if I have first turn, it sucks because he knows that he's going to deploy all his guys under 36 inches, no matter what I do. Yeah, that may sound good because he's far back, but it also sucks because you can't get first blood. You can't get anything because of it. So I usually try to go second on that purpose and deploy mine accordingly to that. Uh, that's on every single list, but... Most lists, if they have a lot of 36 inch range, they're happy, but most lists don't. Uh, it becomes, um, I'm sorry, it's a, it's a more dangerous kill zone. And why I say that, because when you're playing the long table, you have a wider kill zone. This one has a very condensed kill zone. Uh, you're only fighting with a 48 inch range instead of a 72 inch table. So 48 inch wide kill zone. You gotta come across that. An opponent can cover that sector easier with uh, smaller range guns. 36 gauge guns are very deadly at that range once they start coming across the table. Um, same thing with objectives. If it's a, Remember that freaking relic missions that the relic was right in the center oh, the on greatest. this damn deployment type was <laughs> horrible. Yeah. Horrible. I, agree with that, I mean in a tournament it was so hard to win because uh, <laughs> it just was you would blow the hell out of each other trying to get this damn relic off the table. I gotta say that was a really fun one. Did just every tournament would use around. this yeah. damn deployment it cool. too. It was hard. <laughs> um, there's not too much I can say with this one that you don't know. It is one of the most annoying deployments just because of uh, how far you are from everything. Even if you come in as a reserve from this reach. damn table hedge, by the time he gets up there, yeah. you're pointless. You come in turn three. You've done nothing. Because really not a lot of things has a 72 inch range, right? There's probably some tanks or something that I'm not familiar with. But there, I mean, I think last cans have pretty well. I, I think, think it's 48. 48, yeah. yeah. I can't remember. But so. There is right. tanks. I know even the do have 72 inch range, but most of it um, don't. So this is a very annoying strike. So how do I deploy it to accordingate that? Um, we're going to say again there's six objectives. There, that means two would be on your table edge, two would be in the center, and two would be in their side, which is a pretty, pretty fair, fair assumption. assumption. Yeah. Which means you got two secured. That means you can kind of hold back, but now you're going to have to risk. To, don't worry about those two back objectives unless you really have a strong assault list. Um, keep your eyes on the prize, and the better effective way to do it is if you can, if you have a speed list, which I like speed lists, flanking and focus all your troops on one side of the table, and that way you're going to take this objective and the back objective. Rather than go for both the centers, it's easier for an opponent to counter that. Yeah. If you can just go. Flank over 
and he has to, because you're so far on the table edge, even though it is only 48 inches across, it's still difficult with most weapons to hit your vehicles, and because they move 12, turbo boost, fire smoke, whatever you gotta do, you can stay out of his range, and before you know it, you're in the back objective, got line breaker, you got that back objective. So, speed is very important in Hammer and Anvil. Uh, next deployment is Vanguard Strike. Everyone hates this. The only reason I dislike this one because it's kind of a pain in the ass to kind of figure out where your deployment is. You know what I mean? There's, you do. You have to trigonometry. Set, you got to set you. dice up or a damn line up. I mean, it's, it's a pain, pain in the ass. butt to set it up. Uh, yeah. Yes, there's measurements to do it, but you got to set the dice accordingly so you don't deploy over top. And it's it's a pain in the butt. I'm not gonna lie. I'm not gonna say it's it sucks for horde armies to play. I'll definitely say that because uh, you're you're kind of limited, really, if you think about it. You're only what like uh, twenty one. You're clustered. Inches up or something. Any yeah. kind of arm, any army of that is in yeah, a big cluster. When you deploy, if you got lots of mechanized or vehicles, you're in a big uh, kill zone. And with that kill zone, some of can exploit that. They can drop fire <laughs> plates on you. Uh, now with titans being allowed and forge world and get all those forge world games, it's it's dangerous to be in a cluster. You can get taken out and tabled very okay. fast. Okay with this uh, cluster formation. So what do I do in that cluster formation? Um, again, because the cool thing about it is, as you can see, on as you turn on your page, uh, you can see you can get really far over in the center. So you're almost across the table with some speed. So if you can get a mechanized unit right near that end of, uh, right in the middle, imagine this is the long end, and I know it's the wrong side, but imagine you deploy, this is your normal table edge over here, but this is how far the line goes out. You can deploy a unit right here, which is now almost across the table, to go out. So you, you have to get out fast. It's, a, it's a, like a breakout mission. you got to leave your position quick and assault. Oh, Again, me that's why mechanize is so important, because you can move out. And mobility, like I said, is 7th edition. And if you're not using mobility, you got to rethink it, because it's a new edition, and that's what they want you to do. Um, or anything, you just really gotta adapt to you know what's what's being played yes. against you and what you have to work with. And the reason things. by because maybe you have a tank and I get or say if you have a, uh, a rhino, it's only thirty five points. The first shot kills the rhino. Yes, it sucks if it's a first blood kill, but it's not killing a whole tactical marine squad. The tactical marine squad now has to get out and blah 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 and go from that. He has to waste quality firepower too because it still is armor eleven uh, front. I mean you can't be shooting bolters at it. He can't be shooting. Uh, a strength five can glance it to death, but pretty much he's going to be using a strength seven, strength eight weapon to kill a rhino. That's a good use. Yeah. I mean, it's a thirty-five point model. He's using a strength eight on it. Go ahead, because your tactical marine squad inside it is probably one hundred seventy, one hundred eighty points, maybe a little bit more with some upgrades. And they'll make their they'll make that points back easily. Right? And yes, they can assault when it gets blown up, but who cares? They're yeah. probably a tactical marine squad. They'll just shoot, so that's fine. So it's a give and take uh, uh, on that situation. Um, um, deployment, I said, so important. You can't uh, win now 40k very easily without mechanized. You gotta be able to go to the table. You gotta be able to move. And you gotta be able to protect your units from uh, all these wonderful D weapons. I mean, even a D flamer will come in and it can't flame all your guys if you're all in transports. It can blow your vehicles up. Now you're gonna get out and at least you can bring down those wraith guard. You can't leave home without your car. You gotta bring your car, or else you're gonna take too damn long to get to work, and you're not gonna get there. You know, it's the best way to describe it. You gotta, you know, gotta adapt. Analogy. So, that's pretty much all the deployments that we really need to worry about. Um, if there's any questions on this, and how, you, if you want to write me up on a comment and say, how do I deploy to counter such an army, I will touch base of a comment, or if we get enough feedback on it, we will make a video on it. Um, because there's so many different list types, I could be here all day telling you how to deploy against different armies, but I ran through the basis of how you want to deploy. Um, Thanks for watching, guys. Bro, do you have anything to add before we? Uh, um, yeah, Pro knew that there wasn't much he could add on this because uh, he's just just got, he's more of a tactical player than I am. Um, basically, just uh, remain adaptive. Pretty much has been my strategy, and just kind of work with what you've got and do your best. And you know, um, he's always had a adaptive list. Like he had Dark Elder for since about fourth edition. Sure, so yeah, Dark Elder is probably one of the fastest armies yeah. until some of the upgrades now that Elder has. They've always been. Uh, very quick in the table, and he recognizes mobility back then. Fifth edition recognized mobility. Um, sixth edition got rid of it. The tanks were just too easy to kill. Everyone stopped it. Seventh edition, vehicles were scrapped. They brought vehicles back yeah. because vehicles make them a lot of money. For a small little piece of plastic, they get seventy to hundred dollars. They know that they made them a little bit better. They're not hard to kill. You can't kill them with standard weapons. I mean, Imperial Knights. You can't even blow up on an explosion roll. They take a D three points. I mean, it's uh, vehicles and armor. 
are brought back. So jump on the bandwagon or at least find a way to win without it. And there is a few ways to win without it. Like, but even with Tau, which I swore I'd never run tanks, I'm running Devilfish now. So, and they've worked out for you. And they work out yeah. amazingly. So adapt, adapt or die. So thanks for watching the video. Please uh, subscribe, share. We appreciate it. More to come.